Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is my hands-on, first-looks review of the Fujifilm GFX100, a medium-format mirrorless camera with 102 megapixels, built-in stabilization, phase-detect autofocus, and 4K video. It costs £9,999, or US dollars, and looks set to shake up the high-end market by combining the quality of top-end medium format with the speed and handling of a smaller system camera. I had a chance to shoot with the GFX100 in Japan alongside the earlier GFX50R to see just how far the format has evolved. Fujifilm described my GFX100 sample as being final hardware running not quite final firmware, but the quality should be very close to production models. I'll share my first impressions in this video and produce an additional in-depth review once I've fully tested a final production model. As always, if you find my reviews useful, you can support me with a like and a follow, and if you really like them, you can treat me to a coffee or yourself to my in-camera book. There's links below for all of that, along with ones to check the prices. Cheers! The headline feature of the GFX100 may be its massive resolution, but for me the most important story is the improved handling and usability. Traditionally, when you think of very high resolution medium format photography, you're locked to a tripod, often tethered in a studio with extensive post processing. Now, the GFX100 can certainly be used like this if you like, but for the first time, this is a very high resolution medium format camera that you can easily shoot handheld in the field, and thanks to Fujifilm's processing, the images are also very usable straight out of camera. The GFX100 employs what Fujifilm describes as a brand new sensor sporting 102 megapixels, double that of the earlier GFX 50S or 50R, and delivering images with a whopping 11,648 by 8,736 pixels. The sensor shares the same 43.8 by 32.9 mm dimensions as the previous 50 megapixel version, giving them 1.7 times the area of 35 mm full frame. But crucially, the new sensor now employs a back illuminated design that reduces noise and should hopefully compensate for the higher pixel density. It also becomes the first medium format sensor with embedded phase detect autofocus, boasting more confident coverage across the entire frame. The autofocus software and algorithms with face and eye detection are inherited from the latest X-T3 firmware, and while the GF lenses are typically slower than the fastest X-series models, the GFX100 still enjoys noticeably quicker focusing than the earlier GFX bodies. And in another first for GFX and medium format in general, the sensor is stabilised within the body with a 5-axis system claiming up to 5.5 stops of compensation. This absolutely transforms the usability of unstabilised lenses, although right now GF lenses which include their own optical stabilisation will override rather than work alongside the sensor system, as Fujifilm reckons that's already good enough. To illustrate the GFX100 stabilisation in action, here's a 4K video clip I filmed handheld with the GF 110mm f2 lens with stabilisation disabled, and the wobbling here is pretty obvious. And now with stabilisation enabled, where the image has become so much steadier. This not only makes handheld video possible, but also increases your chances of enjoying the full 102 megapixel resolution when shooting stills handheld. Like all stabilised systems, it also makes composition much easier, especially at longer focal lengths, and I also found it particularly useful when manually focusing with a highly magnified view. In your hands, the GFX100 is a substantial, but by no means unwieldy camera, very similar in size and weight to a Canon EOS 1DX Mark II, or indeed the GFX 50S when that model's fitted with its optional battery grip. The GFX100 is weather resistant and has a comfortable main grip, and like a professional DSLR, also features an integrated portrait grip with duplicate controls. Interestingly though, the vertical grip itself is thinner and smoother than the main grip, which leads to a slightly inconsistent handling experience, where I also found the thumb joystick harder to reach. I believe having a matching portrait grip would have increased the size and weight of the GFX100, but personally I would have accepted that sacrifice for the consistency offered by, well, the GFX 50S. Fujifilm has historically offered screw-on bases though to boost the grips on some models, so maybe one will come for the GFX100. I've got absolutely no complaints about the viewfinder though, which employs a very high resolution 5.76 million dot OLED panel with a huge 0.86x magnification. 
Now Panasonic's used that same resolution panel on its S1 full frame bodies and the 1600 by 1200 pixel viewfinder resolution delivers a visible step up in detail over 3.69 million dot panels which have 1280 by 960 pixels but it's the size and correction on the GFX100 which really impresses. It's easily the most immersive and best quality electronic viewfinder I've ever used and you can see it in action here with face and eye detection also active. It's also removable, allowing you to save space or mount it on the optional tilt adapter first seen on the GFX 50S, although sadly GFX 50S owners won't be able to use this new viewfinder as an upgrade. The GFX 100 employs a 3.2 inch touchscreen that shares the same three-way tilting mount as the GFX 50S and X-T3. You can angle it up by 90 degrees for low level shooting, although that viewfinder head will obstruct some of the view. You can of course slide off the viewfinder head for a clear view when shooting at waist level, but I'd have preferred the amount that allowed the screen just to be pulled away a bit further from the body, making it quicker to shoot discreetly on the street without pulling that viewfinder on and off. Moving on, the screen can angle down by 45 degrees for easier composing at high angles, and by pushing a button on the left side you can flip it out sideways, making it easier to compose at low angles in the portrait orientation. And notice how like the X bodies, the shooting info also considerately turns to stay upright. Unsurprisingly, it won't flip to face forward, but I think owners will be perfectly satisfied by the articulation on offer. The top surface is notable for the absence of traditional dials and the presence of a generous sub-monitor which displays the most recent settings when powered off. Switch it on and it refreshes with a button that lets you reverse the display for easier legibility. Notice the wealth of information including icons for both batteries and I found it easy to view in direct sunlight or dim conditions. Here I have the camera set to manual exposure mode with the front dial configured to adjust the shutter speed and the rear dial adjusting the ISO sensitivity. Both of these dials are fully customizable. The button to the upper right of the screen switches the exposure mode and when set to aperture priority lets you turn the lens ring to set the F number. Setting the lens ring to auto turns the GFX100 to program or shutter priority mode again adjusted by the mode button. The sub-monitor on the top has three pages cycled using the smaller button to its lower right. The second page displays the function of the control dials graphically for those who miss the old shutter and ISO dials of older Fujifilm bodies. Here I have the shutter speed on the right and the ISO sensitivity on the left while the exposure compensation runs along the bottom. Then the third viewing page devotes the entire 1.8 inch 303 x 230.LCD screen to displaying a live brightness histogram. That's fun, isn't it? I really enjoyed using the upper LCD sub-monitor and quickly got to grips with the new exposure and mode adjustments. The other side of the main interface is the lockable drive dial on the left, which lets you switch between still photos, multi, which includes bracketing options, and movie. And notice how the sub-monitor screen switches to show the video settings, which are completely independent from the still photo settings. Now something similar was possible on the X-T3 and X-T30 when you use the silent movie controls because you could set those to ignore the physical dials, but by separating stills and movies here is even more intuitive. Cleverly, the drive button itself also presents options relevant to the particular mode, so when set to still, you can choose between single or the two continuous drive modes, the latter offering up to 5 frames per second or 2 frames per second with live view. Turn the dial to multi and the drive button presents all of the bracketing and multiple exposure options gathered together for neatness. Then turn the dial to movie and the drive button presents the video quality page. By presenting these relevant options this approach lets you quickly get to where you need to and minimizes delving into menus. Turning to the rear of the camera you can see the thumb wheel, a small dial for setting the autofocus mode and an AF joystick. Most of the rear controls seem inherited from the X bodies though where I already considered them unnecessarily small and here even more so. There's loads of space on the rear surface so why not deploy larger buttons, dials and joysticks for easier operation, especially when wearing gloves. And while there is gesture recognition on the screen if you want it, I see nothing wrong in also including the traditional cross keys on the back since there's room after all. Moving on, under the main screen is the rear sub-monitor, a 2.05 inch 256 by 64 dot OLED display showing useful shooting details at a glance. There's four page options, but unlike the top sub-monitor, no handy button to easily cycle through them. Instead, you'll need to dive deep into the menus to find the rear sub-monitor options, which seems a bit inconvenient to me. 
Hopefully it can be assigned to a custom function with a firmware update. Of the four page options available, I like the live histogram view the best, but having all the essential shooting information here means the main colour screen becomes freed up for composition alone if desired. On the right side of the body are twin SD card slots. The huge file sizes could have made an argument for a faster format, but equally SD gives you access to the largest capacities at the cheapest prices, so I'm happy with the decision. Behind a couple of flaps on the left side are the ports, starting with a 3.5mm microphone and headphone jacks at the top. Below these is a USB-C port running at 3.2 speeds and I'm delighted to report also able to charge the battery in camera or power the camera while in operation and you only need a tiny bit of charge in one of the batteries for that to work. Below this is a micro HDMI port which can output 10-bit 422, although given the size of the camera, surely there'd have been room for a more robust full-size port, right? And at the bottom, there's a DC input for powering the camera with an optional adapter, although again, you can alternatively power it over USB if preferred, and it'll work with a power bank. In terms of wireless, there's Wi-Fi controlled by Bluetooth, and like the recent X bodies, you can pair the camera with your phone to seamlessly tag GPS locations as you shoot. I did this for many of my sample images. Fujifilm powers the GFX100 with a pair of NPT125 batteries, the same used in the GFX 50S and 50R, although there's two of them here, housed in a tray which slides into the portrait grip. These effectively double the battery life from the 400 shot quoted rating of the previous bodies to 800 shots here. Again, the batteries can be charged in camera over USB and support rapid charging with sufficient current. During my initial test with two batteries, I managed around three or four hundred shots with several minutes of video, lots of Bluetooth tagging and plenty of playback. In the absence of cross keys on the back, you'll be using the joystick to navigate the menus and under the image settings, you'll notice a wealth of aspect ratios, including a new 65 to 24 panoramic option. These all crop the image, but there's still plenty of pixels to play with. Under image quality, you can choose three JPEG compression levels, recorded with or without a RAW file, or of course RAW by itself if preferred. Superfine JPEGs measure between 40 and 60 megabytes. RAW files can be recorded compressed or uncompressed and in the choice of 14 or 16 bits, although recording in 16 bits slows down recording and doesn't allow continuous bursts. You're looking at about 130 megabytes for a 16-bit compressed RAW file. As a Fujifilm camera, you have the full array of film simulations at your disposal, including Eterna for the slightly muted but attractive video footage, and Acros, which remains my favourite black and white process. The GFX100 also inherits the monochrome adjustment, grain effect, and colour chrome effect of recent X bodies. Meanwhile, the smooth skin option does just that, subtly smoothing skin areas in portraits without losing the biting resolution you want around the eyes. It's a considerate option with the unforgiving resolving power here. OK, now for a selection of photos I shot with the GFX100 using either the GF 32-64mm f4 or GF 110mm f2 lenses, and they're all JPEGs straight out of camera, no processing or adjustment. Again, Fujifilm asked me to describe my GFX100 sample here as having final hardware, but non-final firmware, so while I believe the image quality is very close to final, there may be some enhancements to it or to handling. As you can see, the resolution on offer is outstanding, but what's equally important here is the usability. All of these shots were taken handheld, exploiting the improved handling offered by the stabilisation and the focusing system. Now, don't get me wrong, you still have to shoot fairly consciously if you want to maximise the potential, but in my time with the GFX100, I was struck by how much it handled more like a smaller system camera than a traditionally slow medium format model. And of course, with the Fujifilm engine, you're also getting great looking images straight out of camera. You can download the original files in my review at cameralabs.com. I'll retest the GFX100 when final production samples are available, but for now I just wanted to mention the GFX100's back illuminated sensor does seem to allow the boost in resolution over the 50 megapixel models without increased noise or reduced dynamic range. The GFX100 becomes the first medium format system to capture 4K video using the full sensor width without cropping, up to 30p and in 10-bit 420 internally or 10-bit 422 externally over HDMI. You can record 4K clips up to 60 minutes in length as well. 1080 video up to 60p is available, although there's no higher frame rates for slow motion. And like the X-Series models, you can also choose between 17x9 DCI or 16x9 aspect ratios. 
The full range of film simulations are also available for video, and for all my clips here, I use Eterna for a slightly muted, natural looking video straight out of camera. If you prefer to grade, you can capture very flat footage using the F Log Profile, and again, 10 bit 422 can be recorded over HDMI to an external recorder. You can download these clips at Camelabs.com if you want to have a go yourself. Now back to Eterna for the rest of my clips, which were all also filmed handheld, illustrating how usable the camera is for filming with the built-in stabilization. The GFX100 oversamples 50 megapixels worth of data to generate a 4K frame, which results in plenty of detail. Since the camera starts with 76 megapixels though when shooting in 16 by 9, I assume there's some line skipping to get to 50 to get started, but the results still look very good. I was very impressed by the camera's stabilization when it came to video. All the clips I've shown you here again filmed handheld pretty casually too. As you can see it also does a respectable job when walking along and I wasn't taking particular care over how I was stepping either. Hmm, that makes me wonder, could you walk and talk with the GFX100? Dare I say the V word? Go on, indulge me for a minute. Hello, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs and this is a quick vlogging test with the Fujifilm GFX100. Yes, I'm actually trying to vlog with a 100 megapixel medium format camera that costs $10,000. I don't want to say that too loudly on the streets. Um, now, of course, you'd be absolutely bonkers to vlog with this. I mean, it weighs one and a half kilograms almost with uh, no lens. It's obviously very expensive. The screen doesn't face forward. Um, but there are a couple of reasons why you might want to film pieces to camera with it. First of all is that giant sensor. I'm filming 4K at 25p here. And the camera does that with um, 50 megapixels worth of information over samples. So the quality can look very, very good. It also has built-in sensor shift stabilization. That's all I'm using now to stabilize this image. I'm using the 32 to 64 millimeter zoom here, a 32 millimeter f4. That nice big sensor also, of course, giving you a very shallow depth of field effect, even at 32 mil f4. It also has face detect autofocus across the entire sensor. Now, I'm filming with a pre production model here, and I noticed that the autofocus wasn't as good as it could be for videos, so Please forgive it if it's not looking perfect right now, but it should do, hopefully, by the time it hits the shelves. So, would you vlog with this camera? My arms are already aching, and I'm getting very funny looks, even funnier than normal. So, I'm going to get on with the rest of the review. See you later. Just before wrapping up, a quick note on rolling shutter for stills and video. The GFX100 does have an electronic shutter option to shoot silently, but beware as the readout speed will result in skewing if you or the subject are in motion. Here's the shot I took with the default electronic first curtain while panning across the scene where there's no issues other than some motion blur due to my shutter speed. And now here's one using the fully electronic shutter under the same conditions where the skewing is pretty bad. So like most electronic shutters, fully electronic shutters do use it with caution. I was concerned this would be reflected for video, but Fujifilm's approach to reading and processing the data is actually much more forgiving. In this clip, the rolling shutter effect is much reduced and comparable to many smaller system cameras. Even in this clip, filming out of a moving train window, the skewing doesn't look too bad. What do you think of the video footage from the GFX100? Let me know in the comments. With the GFX100, Fujifilm's medium format roller system truly comes of age. The previous GFX 50S and 50R were certainly desirable cameras, capable of excellent results, but their resolution was matched and their overall handling beaten by the best of the full frame mirrorless models out there. The GFX100 changes all of that. The headline resolution of 102 megapixels from a back illuminated sensor delivers a significant step up in detail without compromising noise or dynamic range, something a full frame body would struggle with. But for me it's the combination of built in stabilization, phase detect autofocus and respectable 4K video that transforms the overall experience and makes it a considerably more attractive option than before. The built-in stabilization allows you to achieve the full potential of the sensor when shooting handheld and makes it surprisingly usable for video shooting. Now you still have to be careful, but this is a camera that feels very comfortable and confident in your hands and away from a studio. Embedded phase detects autofocus across the entire frame roughly doubles the focusing speed over the earlier 50 megapixel GFX bodies, and while the GF lenses mean it's still not as fast as the quickest X series combos, it still feels so much more responsive than traditional medium format. 
And the oversampled 4K video is a huge improvement over the 1080p footage from the original GFX bodies. Throwing a new and mostly sensible approach to mode and drive selection along with the best quality viewfinder I've ever used and you have a very impressive camera indeed. Sure, there's a couple of misses. I know the portrait grip was slimmed down to save size and weight, but I'd have sacrificed size for a more consistent experience with the main grip. I also feel many of the buttons, dials and wheels, especially on the rear, were unnecessarily small, especially given the real estate on offer, and that rear sub-monitor screen really needs a button to cycle through its views. The face and continuous autofocus also performed variably on my sample, but it wasn't running final firmware, so the handling may improve, and even if it doesn't, it's still way better than the GFX50 and other medium format bodies. In short, the GFX100 delivers some of the best looking photos and videos from any system, exploiting the quality of a larger sensor, but handling much more like a smaller system camera. Again, I was struck how little it felt like shooting with a traditional medium format camera in terms of handling, at least until you came to play back the images and looked at that wealth of detail that had been captured. This step up in quality over full frame, coupled with a considerably better handling experience than earlier medium format bodies, means the GFX100 is also the body that GFS lenses have been waiting for. Yes, it's not cheap, and no, it's not a sports camera, but Fujifilm has still managed to deliver the most usable and arguably the most desirable medium format camera to date, and one that has compelling reasons to step up from full frame for those with a desire for the best quality, and of course, the budget to pay for it. That's it for this first looks review. I'll be following it up with a final in-depth review when production bodies are available, so look out for that. And in the meantime, my downloadable sample images and videos can be found at Camerolabs.com. You know what comes next, please like, subscribe, and if you're feeling extra kind, shout me a coffee or treat yourself to my in-camera book. There's links below for all of that, as well as for checking the latest prices. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye.